It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, and I'd like to start by bringing down some expectations. <clears throat> and I'd like to do that by um, telling you the story of the uh, Johnstown flood. Uh, do all of you know the Johnstown flood story? No. Okay. So um, uh, it turns out uh, there was a fellow who uh, died. He was from Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And he came to the gates of St. Peter. And St. Peter said, well, it's customary to give a seminar for new arrivals. And um, you know, we try to talk about an eventful moment in our lives. So the fellow said, oh, that's terrific. I survived the John Johnstown flood. And the Johnstown flood in Pennsylvania was an extraordinary event. And I, with my wits and my cleverness, managed to survive it. So St. Peter said, well, that's, that's very good. But remember, Noah's in the audience. And so I feel somewhat the same way. Um, <coughs> there, um, uh, there are a lot of very knowledgeable, very accomplished people in the mental health fields here. And so um, I do feel like I'm uh, uh, speaking to Noah a bit. Um, uh, the second part of that is that as an American coming to England to talk to you about how to run your health system, um, you know, it's, it's, a <coughs> it's a little uh, what, uh, what my people call chutzpah. And that's, that's Gaelic for, uh, uh, <laughs> for having a lot of gall. Uh, but anyway, uh, what uh, I'd like to do today is spend my time with you um, really focusing on aspects of U.S. health reform um, that involve mental health, but involve uh, issues that the U.K. and the United States are uh, both struggling with at this time and that was addressed uh, in the U.S. health reform legislation so you can get an idea at least what our first cut at the problem looks like. And uh, what I'm going to do that, uh, how I'm going to do that is I'm going to first quickly give you some background on uh, U.S. health reform and then get to the heart of the matter, which is first to talk about uh, efforts to integrate uh, mental health and general medical services uh, and in some cases other services and then to turn to what uh, um, we've already no noted is prevention and early intervention. And I'm going to deal with both the sort of uh, uh, prevention side that looks like traditional public health oriented towards children, but also on the early psychosis side. And then I'll uh, give you some concluding remarks. So um, to put this all into context, uh, I want to sort of uh, give you uh, the origins of modern U.S. mental health policy, which is really with John F. Kennedy. And in February of 1963, just 50 years ago, uh, John Kennedy, uh, in a speech uh, where he set out his intention to introduce legislation that eventually became the Community Mental Health Act, um, set out a to-do list for American society to advance his vision of mental health and what a good mental health policy is. And uh, in that, he called for a policy of inclusion. Uh, he called for a reorientation towards prevention of mental illnesses. Um, he talked about uh, uh, finding ways to uh, provide early diagnoses of mental disorders and to, depending on what the needs were, to offer continuous and comprehensive care for those problems. He called for a, uh, uh, a movement towards improving the quality of care in all settings, but at the same time to reorient our uh, delivery system towards community-based treatment and to reduce uh, the heavy reliance at the time on institutional care. And then he, um, he, did, he called for a uh, revitalization and a restoration which I think very much is what we call recovery today. And he viewed that in the context of building community capacity to make all this happen, so that there would be capacity in communities to support people who are in recovery. And what is striking about that is, uh, well, are two things. First, that it was an extraordinarily modern view. It is so much the same of what we are trying to accomplish today, at least in the United States, and at least from my uh, last few days here and previous visits, it seems to be very aligned with what you're trying to accomplish here in the UK. Um, what's also remarkable um, uh, about it 
is that it remains our de facto policy today. It is uh, um, uh, trotted out almost every time that there's a national gathering. So when President Carter had his commission, when President Bush had his commission, when President Clinton had his national conference on mental health, each time we begin with this kind of um, to-do list. So let me now turn to uh, U.S. health reform, which really sits on three cornerstones. Uh, the first is uh, expansion of public insurance. And you have to re remember uh, that fundamentally we had a problem that you people probably have trouble understanding. We had 50 million uninsured people in 2009. And our aim and what will hopefully result uh, starting in 2014 is, is that we will bring down that number to under 19 million uh, just in, a few, in the next few years. And so that is a dramatic shift in U.S. policy, but it's something that's very foreign to you here. But two parts of the health reform. One, expansion of public programs to support public health insurance and to change the structure and the conduct of private health insurance markets and to provide subsidies for people who are somewhat better off so that they can buy private health insurance in these newly designed markets. So those were uh, two of the three cornerstones. The third cornerstone is what we call delivery system reform, and really that is going to be the focus of my remarks tonight. So uh, <clears throat> delivery system reform, uh, as I talk about it tonight, uh, is going to involve integration and early intervention and prevention. Uh, but before I get to the details of how that applies in mental health, what I want to do is quickly give you the philosophy that sits behind that. And again, this is a case of the United States becoming more like uh, Britain, uh, perhaps at a time when you're trying to become more like us. Um, and that is, increasingly, the philosophy in the United States is that we must bring more of our healthcare dollars, more of our resources together under budgets hand it off to clinical organizations that have the capacity to integrate and coordinate care under a budget and to do so um, uh, in a fashion that puts particular emphasis on managing complex care for vulnerable populations. And this seems to be well understood here, but it's new to us. The approach that we take in the United States is um, deliberately somewhat modest because, in fact, it admits that we don't exactly know what will work. We have lots of ideas and we're placing what I consider to be smart bets, but we're not sure what will scale best under what circumstances. And when you have a country as big and diverse as the United States, you have to allow some leeway to learn. And so what uh, you see in our Affordable Care Act is a variety of options for scaling up uh, the uh, construction of these new organizations under budgets and a, um, a set of opportunities to quickly learn, adjust, and move on. And it is really with that in mind that uh, delivery system reform is proceeding. And with that comes political risks, because as you can imagine, uh, the United States uh, uh, is no more uh, tolerant of failure than probably the British Parliament is. Uh, and so uh, when you uh, consciously go out there and try a lot of things, some of them will fail. And that puts pressure on. So let me now turn to integration uh, of mental health and general medical care. Uh, the uh, overarching philosophy about uh, how we want to orient patient care in the United States is uh, one where we call it patient-centered care, where the patient is at the hub of everything we do. Uh, as uh, Don Berwick uh, says, he says the patient and the patient's preferences and needs should be true north, and that is the case. Now, what that means in terms of integration is that uh, patient-centered care, as you integrate uh, care means, um, <clears throat> means meeting people where they are. And that comes from a recognition that people with mental disorders are very heterogeneous in their needs in their, and in their circumstances. 
And so the implication of that is that it, it is as important to make sure that we take uh, primary care and bring it to specialty mental health care as it is to take mental health care and bring it to primary care. And both in the United States and in the UK, the emphasis in recent year has been take to bring specialty mental health care to primary care settings. But in fact, people who are severely and persistently mentally ill uh, have difficulty negotiating complex systems very often and typically touch the healthcare system most frequently in the specialty men mental health side. And so for that reason, uh, we want to make accommodations so that they can get the health care that they need in, that, in their natural context uh, for getting treatment. So what do we know about making integration work? Well, we actually know a lot about making integration work uh, on the primary care side, and we know considerably less about how to bring uh, medical care and other supports and services to behavioral health side. However, even though the evidence is much more limited, there are some promising models, and as I'll uh, describe to you, we're making some really serious investments as part of the Affordable Care Act in learning what to do there. So um, the four active ingredients <laughs> that have been shown through uh, roughly 35 randomized clinical trials of uh, bringing mental health to primary care under a title that we call the collaborative care model, uh, uh, there are really four essential ingredients. I'm going to focus on two. The first is physician time, that the primary care doctor has to spend time with the patient to find out uh, what the problem is and to develop a strategy. Now, uh, a few years ago, some of my colleagues uh, did a series of videotaped studies of primary care interactions. And what they discovered was that when a mental health issue was brought up by a patient in the context of a routine primary care visit, on average, the, the physician spent two minutes addressing the issue. So it was, the interaction went something like this. Um, Doctor, I've been feeling very blue lately. I've been slow. I haven't been able to find any enjoyment in my life. And the doctor said, well, uh, I'm very, very sorry to hear that. Um, how about the Arsenal Spurs game? Uh, the <coughs> that was a, 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 a splendid match, don't you think? And more or less, that is the w way the interaction ended. And uh, we literally did hundreds of videotapes of this. And really, the average, con the average amount of time spent on a mental health problem is two minutes. So uh, the second piece is case management. The care manager is the critical link. And what is critically important is the training and the supervision of the care manager, because they are, in fact, the day-to-day -day face of the medical practice with the patient. And uh, then you need the backup of special uh, specialists and some technical support in the form of the ability to track patients longitudinally. So um, this is to remind you that I'm an economist. Um, what you have here are roughly 35 randomized trials where we've taken um, the results and converted them into quality-adjusted life years, which is the me metric most commonly used in cost-effectiveness studies. And each of those rays represents a cost per quality-adjusted life year. <laughs> So on the extreme left, you can see it's $100,000 per quality-adjusted life year. And as you move to the right, you can see that almost every data point on that graph lies below 100000 And that's because all of them meet the criteria of producing a quality-adjusted life year for at least $100,000. If you look a little further, the vast majority actually also fall even under 25000 and what that means is that uh, whether you're Australian or Canadian, uh, British or American, most, almost all of these studies uh, come in with interventions that would meet the cost-effectiveness criteria in place in each of those countries. And so this is a good deal no matter how you cut it. 
Now let me turn to people, let, let me turn to people with severe and persistent mental disorders. So what I've just talked about applies mostly to depression and anxiety in the context of people who mostly touch the world through primary care, mostly touch the health, health world through primary care. Um, people with severe and persistent mental illnesses, or as, as you would call them here, severe and enduring mental illnesses, uh, face, have, carry very complex needs. They need health, typically mental health services, uh, housing, food security, income, and employment supports. Uh, the IPS work uh, by the center is exemplary of that. Now, schizophrenics in the United States and other people with severe uh, and persistent mental illnesses typically have high rates of admissions, very high rates of readmissions. Uh, they are typically uh, poorly connected to community-based services as they leave hospital. And uh, because about two-thirds of them carry significant chronic medical conditions, it turns out only about half of them get treated for those. So imagine a schizophrenic with diabetes or schizophrenic with congestive heart failure. Less than half get treated for those conditions in a year explicitly. So the remedy that's been emerging is um, to create a uh, team-based approach to managing care. It's a multidisciplinary team. Uh, typically led by a uh, medical professional, either a uh, physician or a nurse, and typically includes a care manager, sometimes a peer counselor, uh, other times a community health worker, supported by the capacity for mobile treatment, and again, information technology so that people can be tracked longitudinally, but also to be able to see how they are touching other parts of the system. Are they touching the income support agency? Are they touching the housing agency? And being able to immediately connect to see if that's uh, occurring. Uh, this is uh, early in its life, but this is the model that has been em emerging as uh, the one that is um, our best bet. <laughs> now, the lessons for these organizations uh, are that when you craft an organization to do these things, um, uh, and put all those pieces together, uh, they can produce some uh, very nice results. Uh, Washington State uh, has organized to have a private nonprofit organization that organizes that whole variety of services, takes responsibility under a fixed budget where uh, they are rewarded for, yield, for obtaining savings, and they're rewarded on the basis of the quality of the outcomes they produce. Uh, when that was implemented, it took about two or three years to ramp up, and today we're seeing savings on the order of 13% a year uh, on historical costs and improved quality. Likewise, the Aetna Health Insurance Company has taken responsibility in the state of Pennsylvania for doing something similar and they've yielded savings of about 10% and also have yielded improved out outcomes. Uh, a completely public clinic uh, called the Cherokee Health System has managed to do something uh, quite similar. At the same time, there have been a large number of failed attempts. And really, we're at a point now where we're starting to conduct policy autopsies. And we're doing it because we need to understand the conditions that produce failure. Uh, we've got an inkling of what produces success, but we also need to know what produces failure. And so we're starting to do those. Now, the economic circumstances that make this work are to have a budgeted health system that unite all the uh, disparate strands of funding. Uh, <coughs> two, uh, that allow enough managerial flexibility so that resources can be matched to patient needs flexibly. And where, uh, when there are savings, uh, the organization gets to share in the savings, and when there are um, losses, the organization also is responsible for at least a share of the losses. Now, what has the United States been doing? What does the Affordable Care Act say about how we accomplish this? Uh, there are four parts to the strategy. The first is we're creating new institutions and payment arrangements to promote this. 
The second is we're measuring what we do differently. We're holding people accountable to a different set of measures than we t historically have. Uh, we're creating new grant programs so that we can uh, um, support innovations and quickly um, uh, evaluate them, report back, and adjust. And then finally, we are training professionals to do uh, a better job in primary care. Let me quickly tell you about a few of these. Health homes are organizations that focus on the most severely ill uh, people. Uh, they require coordination and integration. Not only must you pull together medical care and, uh, and mental health care, you must also attend to housing, income support, and food security. Um, the federal government pays for 90% of the coordination activities. So care managers, mobile treatment, and health information technology systems are 90% paid for for two years of setup uh, by the federal government, and then after that, they, they must be self-sustaining. Uh, the corresponding uh, new organization, new institution, uh, for the more common mental disorders is a patient-centered medical home. Uh, here we have, uh, these are much more primary care oriented, and they must meet certain standards in order to qualify for reimbursement as one of these comprehensive patient-centered medical homes. And as part of that, they need to show the capacity to manage complex chronic conditions and must show the uh, capability to screen for mental disorders and depression in particular. Second, we're trying to shift the way we measure and hold people accountable. So we're now, uh, uh, and I'm just going to give you three examples of some of the new um, performance measures that we're using. The first is we're, screen we're requiring evidence that people are using well-validated tools for screening for uh, mental health and substance use disorders in primary care. And for example, one of the measures requires the use of the PHQ-9, which is a widely validated depression screener. Second, we're now requiring uh, physical health conditions that very often travel with mental disorders to uh, be attended to uh, in high-risk uh, circumstances. So mental health assessments must now be conducted for people with chronic back pain, you know, because there's high prevalence there. They tend to travel together. And then there must be evidence-based screening and treatment for um, medical conditions that have high prevalence among people with severe and persistent mental disorders. So, for example, with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, uh, diabetes and um, lipids and cardiovascular disease must be screened for and attended to. And if there isn't a regular set of screenings uh, conducted, um, there are financial and accountability consequences for, for that kind of failure. As I mentioned earlier, we're also investing in trying to learn quickly about what to do. Uh, we have uh, put $135 million of new money into uh, creating uh, uh, a pool where uh, innovations in bringing uh, medical care to specialty mental health care is being supported. And uh, those are being rapidly evaluated using uh, quasi-experimental methods. Uh, for the most part, um, they're getting rapid feedback so that they can adjust uh, their programs. We're also putting $80 million into bringing uh, evidence-based mental health care, such as the um, collaborative care model, into primary care settings, particularly those that serve the poorest Americans. And then we've set a technical assistance center up uh, with $26 million in order to bring the learning back into the field each time. OK, so that's, that's integration. That's sort of uh, what we want to accomplish, why we believe it'll work, and what investments we're making to do it. Let me now turn to prevention and early intervention. <clears throat> we're at a time right now where um, I think neuroscience and clinical science are, are opening up opportunities that just weren't really, you know, clearly imaginable 10, 15 years ago. 
this is a, a, a very exciting time. And in a sense, there's sort of two lines of work that are happening here. One focuses on uh, early life. And I'm going to uh, use the, um, uh, what we call the Nurse Family Partnership Program, or Home Visitation Program, which you've adopted here in many places in the UK, and that we've just made, are making a large investment in, in the United States. And then where I'm also going to, uh, the second line is uh, early intervention for psychosis. And that is getting uh, very intensive interest right now, and I'll explain to you why. And uh, we, uh, there, uh, the uh, 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 individual placement and support model, or IPS, uh, plays a central role. Now, what's uh, challenging for policy here is, first of all, these very often fall outside of what we typically think of as, as health or mental health care. And so the usual ways of funding, the usual ways of regulation actually don't work. And so we have to kind of rethink the way we position our policies there. Um, the other thing is that even though we've learned a lot and there's lots of promising activity, uh, we know very little about how to scale these things and how to really bring them to the uh, larger population so that they can have their full impact. And so we're going to have to learn quickly there. Um, let me start with early life initiatives. Uh, the Affordable Care Act set up a thing called the National Prevention and Public Health Fund, which was initially funded with $7 billion um, uh, from 2010 to 2015, and then is supposed to be funded at a level of $2 billion a year uh, ad infinitum, um, as far as ad infinitum goes with a budget problem. Um, there's also the, a specific uh, grant program that was designed for the Childhood uh, Nurse Family uh, Partnership Program or Home Visitation Program that uh, was championed by David Olds. And there was $1.5 billion put into that over five years. And then there are also grants for uh, uh, school-based health systems that include behavioral health. Now, one of the critical things that we've been uh, trying to understand is how to scale. And one of the most important features that we've been discovering is how important it is to target. And uh, these programs, like the Nurse Family Partnership programs, are based on studies and technologies that are really targeted at particular high-risk groups. And because we operate in a world where uh, people care, there are humane impulses, and there are political pressures to sort of do more, there's a tendency in real systems to reach too far, to reach to, into lower uh, risk populations. Uh, and the consequences of doing that are what we call mission creep. And the, and, and the results are often disastrous. And I'm going to sort of illustrate this uh, to you with some data from a, um, uh, a study that was done in the uh, um, uh, middle part of the last uh, decade. This is the Nurse Family Partnership Program. And um, what they did is they investigated uh, the application of this program to three populations. Uh, and all of these are uh, low-income women with newborns, young children. And then there's some additional risk characteristics above, above that whether they have a partner, whether they're alone, um, whether they live in a particular type of neighborhood. But so the low risk is just the general application to that low income population of new mothers. And you can see there that the net social impact is not significantly different from zero. Whereas when you target the high risk population, you have a cost benefit ratio of 5.7 to 1. And a net social impact of about $34,000 per household touched. Okay? That's a tremendously effective program. And that when you sort of take it on average, the way it is applied in many real world settings, you cut the effectiveness of the program roughly in half. When you do this to early childhood education programs, you also easily, by not targeting, can swing things 20 to 40%. So the lesson here 
is that uh, if in fact you're going to um, uh, go down this road and use the money uh, well and uh, set yourself a foothold so you can build, you must target or else you undermine the credibility of the program. Let me talk about the second ch scaling challenge uh, for prevention programs, which is fragmentation. Uh, most public health and human service programs are delivered in the context of multiple funding streams, many parts of the bureaucracy having their fingers on it, and then sometimes arbitrarily assigning certain parts of the bureaucracy to lead a program. Uh, and when that happens, if you're not very careful, you can undermine the incentives to implement a socially efficient program. And let me give you some data to illustrate that. This again uh, is another study of the Nurse Family Partnership Program. And what you've got here is in the top part of the uh, table are the benefits to different parties by types of benefits. So you've got the criminal justice system on top, then education, then others, which is primarily health care. And you can see, for example, that if you're sitting in the education department and you talk to the people you talk to and you watch, uh, you collect the data that you typically collect, you would perceive this as having benefits valued at about $5,000 per household, when the cost of the program is $9,120. Looks like a bad deal. But the social benefit cost here is $27,200 over $9,000. So very socially efficient. However, only if you're, you give responsibility to the Criminal Justice Bureau will you have an incentive to implement this and view it as a good deal. So fragmentation, targeting, both are critically really important, and um, what, what it means is that you have to both target, but also create accountability and organizational arrangements so that you internalize the cost and benefits so that you can see the full <coughs> range of costs and benefits when you make your decisions about implementing. Okay, let me now turn to early interventions. And, um, uh, here, this is uh, typical of uh, what we call the alphabet soup of U.S. healthcare. Uh, but the top panel of this table shows you uh, the amount, the number of people, and the amount of money we spend on supporting people with mental illnesses uh, through income support programs and disability programs. So SSI is a disability program. SSDI is a disability program, and TANF is a program for low-income mothers, okay? What you see is of the roughly 330 billion, one-third of a trillion dollars that we spend a year on supporting people with mental illnesses in the United States, um, roughly 20% um, uh, roughly of it involves treatment. That's that $65.6 .6 billion. The rest of it involves things like income support. 200 billion of that number, right? Roughly two thirds of it is for income support. That means that you can bet that US policymakers are very worried about disability and disability policy as it touches on mental health. Now, for about 20 years, we've had programs in the United States that have tried to do things to get people off the disability rolls. Uh, we've tried something called the Ticket to Work program. We've called, tried something called the Mental Health Treatment Study, which <laughs> used the IPS model plus evidence-based psychopharmacology and psychosocial treatments to try to get people off of the disability rolls, back to work. And the results have been extraordinarily disappointing. Um, what we've recently started to do is to explore the possibility of rather than trying to open the back door, is to do something about the front door. And that is, can we do something to intervene early to keep people off the rolls? And there are sort of some promising things. 
But just to remind you, in the U.S. right now, our Social Security Disability Insurance Program is in negative cash flow and is slated to run out of money in 2016. So this is serious. And the two largest um, groups making new claims on that program are people with musculoskeletal problems and people with severe mental disorders. So you can imagine that there's some serious pressure on the mental health field to come up with some solutions. So we ask ourselves three policy qu questions in pursuing this. One is, are there enough people on the margins that if we have something good to give them, we can keep them off the rolls? Are there, good can are there enough good candidates to keep people off the rolls? Second question, are there enough pro are there pro in interventions that are promising enough so that if there are enough people there, we have a chance of affecting them. And then third, can we align incentives to make the relevant organizations take up the right programs and target the right people? So the answer to the first is yes. If you talk to people who are applying for disability, if you talk to people who are on disability, they say overwhelmingly they want to work. Second is that there's an extraordinary amount of idiosyncratic reasons that people either are on or off disability. Sometimes it's who your examiner is. Sometimes it's where you live. Sometimes it's the color of your skin. And therefore, there is a suggestion that there's room to influence where you wind up. And then there's some, uh, there's some evidence from what we call the um, a duration of untreated psychosis that suggests that we can uh, do better. So what are the effective interventions? Well, individual placement and support um, has been established as the most effective method for, people, uh, for uh, helping people with severe and persistent mental illnesses to regain some work activity. Um, the evidence uh, is, uh, is strong, but as I said, it is not promising for getting people off of disability. It improves their work, but not to the degree where you're going to get them off the rolls. However, there are some promising indications that if you make that a part of an early intervention program, it can actually keep people off the rolls. Uh, and we've had a couple of versions of that in the United States that have yielded some uh, 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 suggestive results. However, there's a lot of uncertainty here. So, where does this bring us policy-wise? Uh, there are two streams of ideas about policy. One is to create a pure, a traditional public health program. That is, uh, develop a program that finds a mechanism to identify people at their first episode of psychosis, provide money that is separate from disability programs or low-income programs so that you can bring treatment to people before they're disabled, while they're still in the workforce, while they're still attached possibly to their schools, and make that a traditional program and a traditional public health program and make that investment. Now, the, um, uh, it re that requires uh, very careful monitoring, careful implementation, fidelity to what we've learned. Uh, it also creates an uneasiness because it means getting involved in people's lives, sometimes before they're really ready to have you involved. And in, the, in, in Britain, uh, I think there's generally a little bit more comfort with the government mucking in people's lives. In the United States, uh, it's a very unhappy debate that you have when you start going down that route. Uh, but nevertheless, it is probably some version of that needs to be done if you're going to be successful here. The second line of policy has to do with creating incentives for interested parties. And I'm going to just mention two ideas. One is Employers in the United States all play, pay for disability insurance. So the idea is to say to an employer, we will, if you put in best practices, if you put in a prevention program that is evidence-based, 
um, we will give you a break on your um, disability insurance tax. And we will start to experience rate you based on your success. And so rather than everybody paying the average, uh, we would experience rate. And so people who perform better uh, would do better financially. That's one idea. And that, what that does is it creates an incentives for the field out there to adopt the things that work. The second is to do something similar for the states, which is to say to states, if you adopt, we will, we will provide money to provide short-term income support and to provide uh, public health outreach to these populations for treatment, for early intervention, and we will give you bonuses if there's a change in the population prevalence of disability in your state. And um, <clears throat> both of those sort of are delegation models with incentives as opposed to direct intervention through public health means. So that's the state of play on uh, early intervention. So in wrapping up, I want to say that in the United States, um, the enactment of the Affordable Care Act, along with our tremendously difficult budget problems, has totally jolted the way we think about health care. And uh, with that has created opportunities to do things differently. Reorganize within a budget, be more flexible, use evidence. We're willing to try things, learn quickly, and feed it back. Second is the confluence of budget payment arrangements and improved uh, efforts to measure performance in mental health and the ability to make some new investments is pushing integration in the United States uh, of mental health and physical health in ways that has never happened before. And it is really a wave. Uh, everywhere you turn, new organizations are trying to figure out how are they bringing mental health into their new budgeted organized healthcare system. Um, scientific progress should make us optimistic about the potential for early intervention and prevention, and there are new opportunities. And on the uh, child side, the investments we're making in nurse-family partnership overcomes problems that we've been struggling with for 30 years. 30 years ago, David Olds' studies showed that they were cost-effective and showed they were phenomenally um, uh, well implemented. Uh, but it's taken us 30 years to get there on a large scale. And it's because we changed the way we think about paying for these things. And then um, I think the failure that we've experienced in doing something about the back door on uh, dealing with disability and psychosis has now, alongside the intense budget scrutiny that we're getting on disability programs, forced us to look somewhere else and is um, you know, allowing us to have some hope uh, because of the neuroscience and some of the early uh, positive experiences we're getting on uh, first episode, treatment of first episode psychosis. And so that really is the frontier, and that's where we are. So um, I just want to leave you with one thought, which is um, uh, there are two things that happened when uh, US health reform passed. Uh, the first was um, there was a gentleman named John Dingle who was, um, whose father had worked with Harry Truman to introduce the first national health insurance bill in the 1940s. And he took over, uh, John Dingle took over his father's seat in the Congress and uh, has since the 60s fought for national health insurance. And he sat there, and he was now on crutches and things, and he sat beside President Obama as he um, signed the bill, and he wept. And it was just like uh, just a stark moment. And then you had the other end of the spectrum, which was our vice president, um, uh, who uh, uh, people who could read lips uh, noticed that he said, this is a big, as we say, Biden deal. <laughs> and... Uh, this was a big deal for all of us, and it really mattered. And thank you for listening. Okay,